Warning, this video may contain content that may not be suitable for children or anyone else that is easily offended. Strong language, graphic content, nudity, bad jokes, and a possible idiot, aka myself, may be featured in the following clip. Viewer discretion is advised. You're not responsible for any damage that you receive watching this video. <laughs> What's up, y'all? It's Zims, and welcome to top three places you cannot go to, but people went anyway by Mr. Ballin. As I said before in the last video, he was nice enough to let me use his videos to react to him, so I appreciate that. And like he always says, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and creepy delivered in the story format, please head over to his channel. I'll leave a link down to the description to his YouTube channel, his social media, and somewhere on the screen. I mean... I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure we've all been to places that we couldn't go to and we went anyway, like the ice cream truck. <laughs> I was banned from going to the ice cream truck, but that didn't stop me from using the dollar that my grandpa gave me. But shoot, not anymore. A dollar can't get you nothing, boy. You lucky enough to get some. I don't know. A dollar can't get you nothing. Boy, I'm going to go to the store and a dollar to chips be 50 cents. Anything from coconuts to fish to birds to pigs. To people, and in today's top story, tarantula spider. No, that tarantula spider. Wound up on this island, totally stranded, and came face to face with this nightmarish creature. But nope. Before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right channel because that's all we do, and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's he really does story, though. The next cold day. Sneak behind the like button and slap their ears and then run away. Also, please Boy. subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's Yo, when people slap your ears, you get that You know, you're playing Call of Duty and the grenade kind of like lands next to you, but like not on you and you get blown up in that little sound thing. Or shh, what's down there? Number three. Dr. Guy Garman, also known as Doc Deep, was an avid scuba diver, and in 2015, he decided he was going to put his scuba diving to the test and try to break the world record for the deepest recreational scuba dive. At the time, the current record was 1,090 feet, set by a man named Ahmed Gaber in 2014. Red Guy flag number one. to go down to 1,090 feet and then keep going to 1,200 feet and that would be his record setting mark. But in order to do that, you need a dive site that goes down to 1200 feet. But luckily Guy did most of his scuba diving off the coast of St. Croix in the Caribbean, and that area was known for an incredibly deep Oh, that's dive. beautiful. Now, when most people think of scuba nice. diving in the Caribbean, they think of beautiful clear water and amazing coral reef and exotic fishes and everyone's so happy and it's so great and the water's so warm. And off St. Croix, that was true. But if you continued going offshore about 250 feet, you'd reach a drop off that's known as the wall. And we're not talking. I'm sorry, no cap, but I, I legit, I can't swim. <laughs> like, I can like backpedal you know, a little bit, but other than that, I can't swim. I remember I took like the little swimming thing when I was in Germany and I, I think I cramped up on the first lap and I was, that's all she wrote. Crap! A gradual drop off. We're talking about the seafloor going from flat to turning 45 degrees and going straight down two miles into a complete black abyss. Now, the only people nope. who are actually allowed to dive into the wall are very experienced scuba divers with all the certifications. But if you're a tourist and you come to St. Croix, you can still scuba dive off the coast where it is beautiful and shallow and warm and there's reefs and fish but you're allowed to swim out to the edge of the wall. And people report getting out there and standing on the edge of this cliff, looking in the water with their mask and not being prepared for how intimidating it is. I mean, you're standing on one side where behind you is like this tropical paradise and in front of you is this seemingly endless void where we don't even know what's down there. I mean, we've only explored 10% of the ocean. These deep portions of the ocean, we can't get down. So we don't know what's down there. I know what's down there. The Megalodon. Yeah. And that snake from Anaconda. And that big old alligator. I think it was alligator. If it was a primeval, primal, 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 carnival. I don't know. Y'all know what I mean. Boy, if you don't. All of them is down there. They live there. That's their domain. That's why the 90% is them. Because they're that big, bro. They got something down there that'll eat you alive, bro. No cap. I'm not going nowhere. That's no one's ever been down to. I, I just never seen the... The point is, like, why? I value my life too much. Like, I don't, I don't know. 
But for if it wasn't for people like this, we wouldn't even know what half of the stuff on the planet is. So we need, I hate to say sacrifices, but we need people to investigate. <laughs> what you know is that sometimes whales will dive down into these deeper sections of the water and scientists will be tracking their dive. And when they come up again, after only going down maybe one or 2,000 feet, they'll return with these massive bites taken out of them. Megalodon, caught it. There are creatures down there that we haven't discovered yet that are so big and so aggressive that a whale seems like a reasonable thing to go after for food. And so imagine standing on the edge of this cliff looking out and being like, what's down there? Well, our boy Guy decides I'm gonna find out what's down there and I'm gonna do my record setting dive at the wall. And so after meticulous planning and hiring a support team that's gonna be there to help him do this dive, he, his wife, and his son fly to St. Croix and they get ready to do this dive. Guy had arranged for a line to be lowered right at the edge of the wall that was weighted down by an anchor that was gonna go down all the way to 1300 feet and they would put a metal placard at the 1200 foot mark on the actual line so that when Guy went down, he would reach that placard at 1200 feet. That's the record setting mark. He would use a grease pen. Dang, that's a lot of oxygen tanks. To indicate I made it, this is legitimate. And then he would go back up and that's how the dive was gonna go. And so in the early morning of August 15th, 2015, Guy along with his big support team, they head out to the edge of the wall. Guy gets into the water along with his son who's gonna go down with him for the first 200 feet. And he looks up at the support boat and he gives him the okay, he's ready to start the dive. And then he and his son give the signal they're ready to go down and they start their descent into the void. As they're sinking lower and lower and lower in the water column, it's getting darker and darker until it's completely and totally pitch black. They re and then right below that pitch black of darkness, there is something like this waiting for him. Hold on, let me they're like, oh yeah, he coming down here, boy. Just like that. That's exactly what's gonna happen. Watch, I bet. And Guy's son Kip would give his father a squeeze for good luck because they can't communicate. And then Kip would go back up and Guy on his own continues down to the 1200 foot mark. Once Guy was on his own, a timer started because it's very important to track how long he's down at depth. And his team was expecting him to be back up at the 350 foot mark in 38 minutes from when his son left. But 38 minutes came and went and he was not at the 350 foot mark. But even though this is a big problem, Guy had a whole bunch of extra air canisters with him. And so if he ran into any sort of problem, he would be able to continue to yeah. the air. Yeah, like six, six seven of them. Before coming up. It would just mean longer decompression stops along the way out. And since he was tethered to the guideline, they knew he couldn't drift away. And so they just had to wait and hope that he ran into some problem and that he would fix it eventually and then he would come back up again. But he never did. They couldn't really send a rescue mission down to get him because Guy was going so deep. He was the only one that was able to get down there. No one else was qualified or would be able to do it or had the right equipment for it. He was totally on his own down there. It would take three days before they were able to get the right equipment that was able to pull this lineup out of the water and attached at the end of it was Guy, and he was deceased, he had drowned. But the really scary thing about what happened to Guy is when he went down into that abyss, he had all these extra air canisters attached to him. And so presumably he went down the line, probably all the way down to the record breaking mark, and then he got trapped somehow. And as he's trapped on this line in total darkness, surrounded Jesus. by who knows what down there, probably Megalodon. several hours, he just cycled through his backup air canisters wondering Am I gonna run out of air and drown? Or am I gonna get attacked by some animal down here? It had to be a chupacabra, bro. 100% chupacabra. Bro, I'm telling you, bro. It had to be some, I don't know. Is chupacabra is real? I thought I seen one on a, yeah, they call them the goat suckers or something like that. I mean, I wouldn't want that name, but for, for masculine alpha reasons, of course. But no, bro, I wonder. But he didn't come back up in chunks, so maybe they're... I'm curious of what he got stuck on. We'll never know. I've always been that kind of person that wanted to, like, kind of, like, wonder what happened to people that disappeared or what happened in the time of the last. That's a horrible way to go, bro. Drowning? Can you imagine fighting for air and you're, like, 1,200 feet? Oh, my goodness, bro. I can't even... You can't even see the top of the water. You can't. Oh my there goodness. There is this tiny little stream Ooh, that winds me. its way through a forest in Yorkshire, England called the Bolton Strid. It's not very wide. You could jump over it. It doesn't appear to be very deep. It looks like maybe a foot or two. And it's not moving very fast. 
but that's all an illusion. There are signs up all over the place that say, do not go near the Bolton Strid. It that's all I need. People. Because just beneath the surface of this seemingly tame water body is a natural booby trap that has a 100% mortality rate, meaning every single person that has ever stepped foot in the Bolton Strid has died. In 1998, Barry and Lynn Colletwer were walking along the Bolton Strid on their second day of their honeymoon, and all of a sudden a torrential downpour starts just raining down on them, and the rocks they were on suddenly got pretty slick, and Lynn slips and falls into the Strid. Barry, being a good husband, runs over to try to save her, and he too he falls, falls in. The yep. A man named Desmond Thomas was on the other side of the Strid, and he saw Barry as he was running for his wife, and he saw him fall in, and he watched Barry's face as he was looking at him as if he was going to stay afloat at the top. Desmond said it looked like someone came up and grabbed his leg and yanked him under the water, and he didn't see him again. Lynn's body was found six days later in West Yorkshire, and Barry's body was found over a month later, 10 miles downstream. In another case, in 2010, an eight-year-old boy named Aaron Page... Oh, man, not Strid the kids. ...for his birthday. There's an area that's totally safe, that's away from the Strid, where people have picnics and that kind of thing. And he came down to the edge of the Strid and was running on the rocks, and he slipped and he fell in. Now, an adult saw this happen and they ran over Don't. and they were able to grab onto him while he's in the water. But the pull from inside the water was so strong that this person couldn't hold on to this child who was eventually sucked under and dragged away and drowned. And beyond these two reports, there's dozens of others of people trying to jump over the Strid and falling in and dying. So why is the Bolton Strid so deadly? If you look at this picture, this- Why? 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 You know the fatality rate is a hundred percent, bro. It's a hundred percent. You pretty much can say the water is Khabib, bro. You're going against Khabib. That's what that that's that's what, that's what that is. And you're going to keep jumping over it. No, stop doing that. You want to be like, oh, I'm the first to jump over the water and live. No, bro. Don't do it to yourself. Don't go out like that, bro. Don't get sucked under the water like a eight-year-old. This is a river wharf, and it's Jesus. just a little ways upstream of the Bolton Strid. And all <clears throat> this water in the river wharf gets funneled into the Bolton Strid. And the way it fits through that narrow section that is the Bolton Strid is the river turns on its side. So when you're looking at the Bolton Strid and you think, oh, that's not that deep. Well, it is that deep. It's at least as deep as the river wharf is wide. And if you look at it on the surface and you say, oh, well, the Bolton Strid's not moving very fast. Well, that's because underneath the surface, there is a whipping current. And in fact, the current that runs through the Strid is so strong that if you were standing on one of the rocks overlooking the water, you're looking down into the Bolton Strid. Well, you're not really standing on solid rock. You're kind of standing on a ledge. You just don't know it because the water meets the edge of the ledge. Underneath the rock you're standing on, the water has completely carved it out. So if you were to fall in, before you get sucked under the water, you would get sucked against the side and you would disappear under one of those shelves and go way far back underneath these rocks. And then you'd get sucked under and drown. And a lot of people who fall into the Strid, they don't make it out the other side. They don't get downstream. They get pulled into all these different caverns and tunnels that have been carved out by that current and they're trapped in there forever because no one's going in to retrieve them. Not even with scuba gear, because if you get in there with scuba gear, the current will push you into these different caves and you aren't getting out again. So what he pretty much just said is, can you imagine how horrible that is to die to get sucked into some crevice and then drown? Bro, that water is on, it's going sideways, bro. Like, I couldn't even imagine, or just imagine, like, you're, like the eight-year-old, man, like, your son, you're trying to hold on to him, and he gets sucked underneath, and he probably, like, he probably was still holding his shirt, too, when he got sucked underneath, like, man, this water is like a, like a Dyson vacuum cleaner or something, bro, like, it's eating people and putting them in, like, little... On June 1st, 1937... Rock bags heart or something. I don't know. I'm stupid. ...on an eastbound flight around the world. It was her second attempt to become the first pilot ever to <clears throat> circumnavigate the globe. She, along I with... I think I heard of her. ...navigator Fred Noonan, flew to Miami and then down to South America, across the Atlantic to Africa, and then east to India and Southeast Asia. The pair reached Leh, New Guinea on June 29th. A couple days later, on July 2nd, Earhart and Noonan would depart Leh, and they would make their way to tiny Howland Island, which was their next refueling stop, but they would never arrive. 
what Earhart was trying to accomplish at the time was such a big deal. And so when they disappeared, it was heartbreaking and it made international headlines and this huge search is launched for them, but they can't find them. And after two weeks, they officially declared they were lost at sea and most likely dead. Three years Dang, later, man. And 350 miles away, 350 from miles, Island, which was the island Earhart and Noonan were trying to get to before they vanished. A British scientist was on this tiny little uninhabited island called Miku Mororo, and they made a startling discovery. He That's beautiful. It looked dangerous, skeleton though. skeleton next to what looked like the remains of a campfire, and their skeleton was kind of torn all over the place, like they had been ripped limb from limb. Because of Niku Mororo's proximity to Howland Island, everybody speculated that this has got to be the body of either Amelia Earhart or Noonan. The bones were sent to two doctors in Fiji, and they unfortunately said, no, this isn't Earhart or Noonan, this is somebody else. So those bones were ultimately disposed of because no one could claim them or knew who they were, and everybody just kind of forgot about it until 2017 when a forensic anthropologist decided to manually re-examine the measurements of the bones that were taken off of Niku Mororo Island and compare them to real measurements of Amelia Earhart. And they discovered that clearly those doctors in Fiji had made a mistake because the measurements of these bones match Amelia Earhart almost exactly. So researchers go back to Niku Mororo Island Dang. and go to so the alive. where these bones were found near that campfire and they look around and they find a couple 1930s era bottles, glass bottles, and one of them is a freckle cream and Amelia oh, yeah, had she lots did. Of freckles and she liked yep. to use freckle cream to cover them she up. She had famous for doing that and so they found that freckle cream on this island near bones that look like they belong to Amelia Earhart. So while some scientists are putting their energy into confirming that yes, those bones were Amelia Earhart. We don't have the bones, but we can show you with the measurements and the freckle cream. And there's another picture that apparently shows the landing gear of her plane off of Niku Mororo Island. So I'm hoping that he talks about how she died because if she made it to that island and her bones is like up on sure it'd be kind of different if it was like off by the rocks you know something like he found it like in the water still but the fact that they're on top side of the beach kind of makes me wonder like how the heck did she like die because I understand it's a big deal you know trying to be like flying and stuff like that I mean I'm, I'm curious because the island looks nice but it looked like so like something was wrong with it. That angle. And there's another group of scientists and researchers that are saying, okay, let's assume that that really was Amelia Earhart. Let's figure out what happened to her once she got to Niku Mororo Island. And the leading theory is horrifying. Although Niku Mororo Island is uninhabited by people, it is inhabited by one of the scariest creatures on the planet, the coconut crab. They're three feet long. They can... Coconut crab. I thought it was gonna be like a a viper or a, 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 a kangaroo. Cause you know kangaroos been ripped lately. I don't know, Jim. They've been going. I need to get that same membership. But they be look. They be having like eight packs and stuff. But anyways, I thought it was gonna be like a, a a lion or gorilla or a pistol shrimp. Something dangerous. Like I don't like. I don't know. I thought it was gonna be something more scary or not something deliciously dipped in butter but i don't know maybe it's i don't really know too much about coconut crabs i've seen people eat them and do like you know what's called mukbang mukbangs i don't know you know you know what i'm talking about when they have like the big seafood platter and stuff like, like that but i don't know we'll, we'll see i mean they don't look too they they look big i don't know if it's a zoomed in photo or if they they inject these things with like, what is it gmos or whatever but I don't know, look kind of big, bro. Look like something off Halo, but we'll see. At least six times their body weight, and they use their pincers that are as strong as a lion's jaw to rip open coconuts, which is- Bro, they got lion jaws for claws, bro. Bruh, lion, lion jaws for claws. Lions, bro. Two lion heads, bro. Can you imagine that you're on the beach, relaxing under the sun, and something comes up and grabs your baby toe with one of those, bruh. Your baby toe's getting chopped off, pretty much. It's gonna be like a little vienna sausage just floating away, like a little, they're chopping it off, bro. This is their main source of food. But coconuts are not the only thing they eat. Damn! Look how big that thing is! Look at this! He, he even like, bruh, bro, look how big these things are. This does not give them justice when people be doing the little, the little cooking things. Bro, look how big that thing is. That's at least 
That's a small dog. That's like a, I don't know. It kind of looked like something off of uh, Fallout, bro. What is that? They'll eat each other. They'll even eat themselves. And they're prolific climbers because they need to get up to get to the coconuts. They can and so climb they trees. They use their climbing ability. Oh my goodness. Climb up and grab birds and break their wings with their pincers and then drag them into their underground burrows where they will eat them too. The few researchers and scientists that have gone out to Niku Mororo Island have said at night, thousands of these crabs will emerge. Oh, from oh, oh. And they'll go looking for. Where my Pokeball at? Hold on, bro. Okay, Kingler, I see you. They have a really keen sense of smell, and they can smell blood. So when one of the crabs goes up yeah. and grabs a bird and starts ripping it apart, the thousands of others will come charging over and swarm the bird because they've smelled the blood, and they'll rip it to pieces, and they'll all try to get in on the action. And so yeah, the they need to make those illegal. Are making their way to Howland Island. They get off track somehow, and they wind up crash landing. 350 miles away on Niku Mororo Island on one of the reefs. Noonan probably dies on impact, and Earhart, who's badly wounded and probably bleeding, she gets onto the island and she makes her way up to that area where that campfire was found. And for some amount of time, Earhart is able to survive off of whatever she had on her in those glass bottles, but in her weakened state and bleeding, at some point she probably attracted the coconut crabs who one night came out and swarmed her ripped her to pieces and ate her. Today, Niku Mororo Island is only inhabited by the coconut crabs and its protected land under the Republic of Kiribati. Good, it needs to be protected. Protected from all of us, protected from humanity. Keep them things where they are. Oh, Niku Horomo. Oh, no. Niku Mororo. Mororo. Niku Mororo. Niku Mororo. Why does it sound like I'm saying Niku Mororo Island? They need to stay over there. That's what they need to do. They need to stay on that island, bro. Imagine getting jumped by a bunch of crab while you're sleeping, bro. Something that you've been taught since you was born that was delicious when dipped in butter. There's not just any old crabs, bro. They're crabs on steroids. P90X. You hear what I'm telling you guys? 24-hour Valley, Valley Total Fitness, bro. They have gym memberships. They have t lion, lion. Jaws for hands, bro. They can lift six times their body weight. And she got jumped by at least eight or nine of them. Maybe more. We don't know. But if I'm sure how it went down, it probably went something like this. <sighs> Ooh, what a night. Oh, man. Uh, hey there guys, this is a, uh, how's it going? Bruh, but no, I'm like, all jokes aside, bro, I would imagine, like, imagine going to heaven and they're like, so how did you die? He's like, man, I, I got killed in battle. And he's like, how did you die? You know, I arrested this kid from a burning building. How did you die? I got jumped by a crab. Huh? What? What? What'd you do? I got jumped by a crab. <laughs> to go, you have to get express permission from the Republic of Kiribati and they send someone to go with you. And there's no airport on the island, so you have to land on a separate island and then ride to Niku Mororo on a boat. But you have to pass through Cyclone Alley, which means you can only travel there at certain parts of the year. And even then it's incredibly dangerous. So that's yeah. it, guys. I hope you enjoyed today's stories. Let me know in the comments what you thought of them and I will pin the best comment at the top of the comment section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, on the next cold day, sneak behind the like button and slap their ears before running away. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My Facts. For both he will respond. It's just John Ballin 416. He will. I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya. So he's he's like being 100% honest with that. Like I messaged him that day and he responded to me like that day. And for someone that has almost 900,000 followers, that's crazy how much he responds to uh, the people that support him and the people that be in the comment section. Because a lot of YouTubers do not do that. And I'm telling you that right now. A lot of them forget 
uh, where they once were and where they came from and the people that got them there. And, but he's not really like that. I'm not trying to throw shade on the other YouTubers like that, but he does a really good job of responding to his um, supporters. I just want to say, man, they need to open up a license to hunt them things because I did not know coconut strips get down like that, bro. Everybody's gangster until they end up on an island with coconut shrimp, bro. I kind of want to do coconut shrimp, <laughs> coconut crabs, and get jumped. So I want to see if that's actually true. I'm actually going to YouTube some videos and see if I can find some some crabs or coconut crabs freaking attacking people or actually going for blood because that, that's insane, bro. They're like, they're vampire crabs, bro. It's like, yeah, they're, they're on Team Edward, obviously, so. I want to end it right here, guys. If you enjoyed my content, be sure you like, comment, and... <laughs> I'm gonna subscribe button be a part of Murder Across today. Again, I don't touch today. I love you. Let me know down in the comment section if you do have any recommendations of any videos that you would like me to react to. If not, tomorrow we're gonna be picking back up Anesia because we're gonna be going for part four. And the game was getting juicy, but I just started off stop. I just started trying out reaction videos again to see how it goes. But again, thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. And don't forget to click down in the description, go follow Mr. Bala and to keep up with a scarathon that's going on right now on his channel.